Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, where we discuss all sorts of things Germanic heathenry related. My name is Jesse. I am your host. Let's get into it. everybody hail and welcome back to this week's podcast the random heathen ramblings podcast another episode another week in hot as muspelheim midgard i think almost everywhere in this world is feeling heat feeling the heat um but here in the here in the southern united states it has been oppressively hot particularly so I hope you're all staying cool and able to get some relief and some enjoyment, um, you know, during these hot, hot months. We're in August now, so for all intents and purposes, we should hopefully be on the downhill, uh, you know, coasting on the downhill side of things. You know, getting ready for those cooler months, those shorter days. I can't wait for it, particularly. I'm looking forward to it. We got some really fun things coming up here in Middle Tennessee in uh, October. You know, we got the Raven Moon Hearts Shadow Mood event. My tribe's got our winter nights. Um, and then just a few short weeks after the end of all that, you know, we're going to be going into my birthday month, November, and we've got something really fun and exciting. Um, a small, I would say small, but a semi small private invite only uh, gathering, which I'm not going to divulge details about yet some of those of you who are watching know of what i speak um but for the rest of you uh in time in due time there there will be more details to come um and the, i what, what i would i will say uh right off of the rip uh regarding this thing is that um it's going to involve my tribe it's going to involve some other friends and allies and uh, companions of of our tribe and there's going to be a lot of uh, weird being interwoven and tied together with this uh, event that's coming up and it's going to involve a, a, a long journey um so that's all i'm going to say for right now but i do want to mention to everybody listening and watching that because of the long journey because of the the distance because of the preparations that it takes to do all that um i am going to be soon here crafting some uh, Elder Futhark rune sets out of birch. Um, they will be for sale. Um, and uh, the sales of, of those rune sets um, are going to help fund this upcoming event that my tribe and others are going to be part of. So be on the lookout for that wherever you are listening, watching. Um, here in the coming weeks, I will have available for sale. Uh, some Elder Fudark rune sets that I make. If you guys have been following me for any length of time and you've seen some of my um, handiwork that I've done before, you'll see it pop up here on the screen. Um, some birch rune sets, which look like this, um, what you're seeing right now. Um, and if you're not watching this and you're not seeing it, they are they are small, you know, about inch. Uh, I would say, uh, but you know, anywhere is between like half to three quarters of an inch up to an inch or so around in diameter. Um, you know, maybe about a quarter inch thick or less thick uh, birch rune discs, and they have all of the 24 Elder Futhark runes on them. So if you're looking to get a rune set for yourself, if you are looking to explore studying the runes, learning the runes, or maybe you want to get them for a gift um, or as a gift for somebody, uh, maybe consider buying them um, uh, as I make them. And then also know that the purchasing of those items are going to help fund this very meaningful trip coming up here in November. So more to come on that. It will be getting released here soon on all of my social platforms. So be sure to follow me. Head down in the description and show notes of this podcast. So that way you are following me on all socials. So no matter where you are, you will see what it is that I'm talking about. All right. So today's podcast is going to be a solo run. I'm doing this one. Uh, without any guests today. Um, but this is a topic that I thought would be a really good one to kind of dive into. Um, and it's regarding hearth cult. 
Now, I know I've talked about this on other podcasts. I've mentioned how important it is, I feel, for modern heathens to establish their hearth cult, to have a hearth cult of their own. Um, and, and, and I've alluded to how important I think that is. You know, I've even gone so far as to say that if you are coming into heathenry without having your hearth cult established, without having something in place already, uh, or without having an understanding of what that is and why heathens find it so important. If you don't have that, then you're kind of putting the cart in front of the horse. You're jumping the gun. You're moving, you know, you're putting things ahead of each other, you know, jumping right into, well, how do I honor the gods? What should I gift to this god, that god? You know, how should I honor, venerate, bloat, uh, feign, gifting, all these other types of things to the gods, to the divine. And, and in the meantime, there is no understanding or precedence um, of your individual cultic practices, or what we refer to as hearth cult. So I want to talk today about hearth cult, why it's so important. Um, but I also wanted to kind of help maybe those that are hearing me say these things and going, what, what does that really even mean? How do I do that? Where do I start? I know uh, that for a lot of folks like myself, when I was first coming into heathenry, um, I didn't know about these things, number one, and I didn't find out about them until kind of later on into my into my practice. And had I known about this up front, I think it would have probably sped me up a bit in terms of where my my progress is. I mean, I'm not upset of of, of the progress that I've made and in, in being at this for, you know, going on uh, soon to be nine years next year, this coming year coming up, uh, 2024 will be you know, nine years that I've been a practicing heathen. But, um, you know, had I known early on what hearth cult was or is and, and why it's important and all that, then uh, I would have probably, I don't know, I, 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 I think my worldview would have developed a little bit sooner. Um, but so in, in addition to talking about why hearth cult is important what it is also going to try and help give you guys some ideas or steps that you can take to establish and build and and maintain your own hearth cult because that is exactly what you need to do nobody can tell you how your hearth cult should be framed uh, uh, or, or built up around this is something that you have to develop yourself there is some framework here that you can that I'm going to be talking about today that you can maybe work off of. Um, but please be, you know, I, I just want everybody to please be aware of the fact that I am not trying to tell you how you should, uh, you know, build your hearth cult necessarily. I'm just trying to give you ideas of how it can be done. And then you take those suggestions, you take that material, and then you go and you build it. You do it your way, your family's way, whatever. And, you know, if, if there are people that are listening and watching that already know what I'm talking about and have it, then uh, please do feel free to comment down below. Share your thoughts. Call into the podcast. Write into the podcast. If you want to call, it's a toll-free. Uh, I say toll-free, but it isn't toll-free. It's a Google Voice number. It's open 24-7, 615-671-9828. Numbers are going to be down here on the bottom of your screen as you see it now. Um, and then you can also right into the podcast, and that is going to be uh, MidgardMusingsTN at gmail.com. So what am I talking about when I say hearth cult? Well, this is the thing that is really going to help you develop your uh, experiences between yourself and the divine later on, because the, the, the framework of, of your hearth cult is going to include things that later on become part of your larger, you know, religiosity, the larger religious practices that you have with the sacred. Um, and some people may be wondering, you know, the, how the Germanic people would have had their, their hearth cults, you know, what did they do? How did they do it? Uh, there's very little, if any, uh, evidence that we know of of how it was done. You know, we, we have some, like, secondhand witness hearsay uh, sort of uh, source material, Tacitus being one of them, 
who mentions that like amongst these people, you know, they had a particular like there's this one line in, in Tacitus uh, in his Germania. He he writes about how the this particular tribe that he was observing or he was getting information about held a particular interest in casting lots and divination and they would cast lots and he, you mentioned specifically that um the 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 father the head of the household would be the one to cast lots for the family and on a larger scale for for like the community or something would be like someone of a priest uh maybe go the something like that right somebody of a religious uh spiritual leader of the of the of the culture at that time and they would be the ones to do it but we we, we hear specifically tacitus mentioned that when it came to families that there was a designated person the father of the man of the house uh, the, of the household of the, of the clan whatever would be the one to perform these acts of divination that is an example of hearth cult now what could be some other examples of hearth cult well your hearth cult could include you um saying a a, a prayer or having a morning wash routine or lighting incense lighting a candle um or a person or persons or spirits beings that are both seen and unseen um near and around your presence around your house around your home around your living space um could be you know that you pull a rune could be that you read something from one of you know the sagas or, or one of the eddas or something like who knows it could be something totally non-germanic like you could have you know just your kind of spiritual practice of of doing something specific that is that you something that you do repetitively every day or maybe not even every day but something on a semi-regular basis that becomes part of your praxis your 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 you do it the same way all the time you build up this kind of muscle memory this habit as it were um of of doing it and that is hearth cult that's you know if, if we want to just cut and trim away all the fat of things like what is hearth cult what am i talking about is these are the the cultic practices the the things that you do in your home to connect with uh the spiritual uh beings that are existing around us that are unseen right could and, and for a lot of us as as germanic heathens there is this sense or this idea of having the spirits of the home the housewites or husvetir uh, is a name that gets used quite often to describe these um, entities that live in the home that we coexist with in our home. Um, another name that gets used, I believe, specifically in like uh, uh, maybe Anglo-Saxon. I don't want to say for sure, but I think it's Anglo-Saxon heathenry. Kolfgod, or maybe it's just Saxon here, but Kolfgod is another name that we hear used to describe basically the same thing it is the spirit of the home the spirits of the home and then throughout folklore we we hear them called different things we hear them called you know tomte the nice um we we you know see different names put to them in different stories throughout different regional folklore um so there are a lot of cultures there are a lot of places that have a something something similar to what i'm talking about this the spirits that reside in the home you know we have the, the spirits that reside in the land the land vitir, um and then we have the spirits of the house or of the home the hisvetir the the kof gods the, the 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 beings that are unseen in most most cases that dwell in the home and and for many people your hearth cult will involve them because again we are looking at our existence our sharing of space with the unseen as a relationship that needs to be maintained and kept up to a certain standard and one of the standards that we have is to exchange in the gifting cycle same as we do with the divine or with the gods right we we gift to them in hopes of receiving gifts in return that reciprocity um, is a very important concept amongst heathens of all different types germanic or otherwise but that is a very common theme that we see even down to the hearth cult practice of modern heathens is that exchange of gifts to the spirits that live in our in our that, that we share space with right um so i i know some people have like a a, a custom to whenever they pour their coffee 
or whenever they have their breakfast, right? Um, they will leave a small offering of porridge, maybe oatmeal or cereal or something, a small bowl of oats, um, you know, or maybe a shot of coffee or something like, I don't know. Again, that that is part of your individual cultic practice. That is part of the hearth cult that I'm talking about. A gift to the house god, the, the husvetir, the, the housewife, the, the vetir that you share space with. Because it is believed that when the vetir are happy, then happy, happy, happy whites, happy home. You know what I mean? Uh, if there is upset, if there is turmoil, if the, if the vetir are upset, then things can go awry in the home. That is uh, a, a theme that we see repeated throughout different, again, folklore um, and sagas too. You know, they, uh, specifically with like the land vetir, it was. Uh, it was believed that if you know if the, the land vitir were upset or if the land vitir were were scared away from their land that the the crops of the land would suffer the people of the land would become sick there would there would be war you know there would be all these things that would befall people in the land to be of of of, a, of harm right that now we have to, we have to we have to boost that gift we have to, we have to do something to Make them happy again. We want to keep the Vatir happy. So when it comes to our hearth cults, um, a lot of folks will have place and time for the Vatir of their home and have that in a private ceremony, maybe just something small every day. Uh, maybe not every day, but again, it, it depends on your hearth cult practice, right? So I want to mention also really quick that there are a couple of sources you know, I always like to try to, whenever I can, back up what I say with source material, if I'm able to. Um, and there are two sources that appear to indicate uh, the importance of a domestic setting. Um, uh, and and these are the names on, on, on your screen. I'm going to also be linking information about these two sources in the description and show notes of of this episode so for those of you that can't see what's on screen just just head to the description or show notes of the podcast and there'll be links to um either uh the source material itself maybe a pdf or at least the name of it for you to be able to research yourself um, but these are two particular uh sources that 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 make mention specifically of you know the importance of having this um domestic setting sort of focus on on hearth cult all right so why is it so important all right now this is going to get into something that i think could spark some more conversation um and i want to just put this out here right now as to why what i'm talking about is so important we're going to get into the what's right the the the, the little idiosyncrasy some of the suggestions and the things that i would maybe recommend uh, people do that have never done it before. But why is what I'm talking about so important? The reason why these things are so important is because, as I mentioned before, heathenry especially, it is an orthopractic, orthopraxis, uh, or orthopraxic religion, which means that the uh, correct performance of right action is more important than correct belief. So the doing of things, right? We, we want to do things correctly. <laughs> That's why a lot of times you'll see uh, folks, I think, really, really drive hard home the historical reckoning of things, right? If it was done historically a certain way, then there absolutely can be no wiggle room about how it's done now. There was a, there's, there's a reason for it. And that's because heathenry uh, is, is looked at as an orthopraxic religion. The repetitive, you know, uh, doing of things as they have been done traditionally, so on and so forth. Now, you all heard me say before, right, that tradition is not about preservation of uh, or the worship of ashes. Tradition is not the worship of ashes. Is it, it is the preservation of fire. This aspect of things, I think, can go both ways. You can become so enamored and so rooted in the past. You can so become so root bound that you don't allow for growth and things don't become, uh, you know, they don't blossom and bloom into the now. And so we're doing things 
um, uh, archaically or, and, and, and things that just don't apply anymore. Um, so again, there's a fine line. There is, I think, value and, and purpose and reason to have things done in a, in a way that was done, uh, at least that we can rec recall and, 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 and have source material back us up and say that it was done a certain way. I think that it's important to have it, you know, done that way, at least to some close proximity now without getting too far off into the weeds with it, right? So how bloat is done, right? That is something very specifically that we have uh, documented that, you know, there were, there were, there was, there were certain items, there was a way things were done, there were um, materials that were there that were present, you know, so without those materials, without it being that specific way, then it is not bloat. We can call it something else, but we cannot call it bloat because it's not, it doesn't involve or include those specific things. Semantics, okay, like, you know, we can argue that all day long. If you, if you want to call what you do bloat um, and it doesn't involve any of those things, I'm not going to be the one to breathe down people's necks and be like, but you're saying it wrong. I might just genu genuinely share like, hey, don't know if you know this, but from a historical aspect, to call something to do bloat, right, to have bloat means a very specific thing with, with specific things present. Um, maybe they call it that because they didn't know. Maybe they just thought it was an overarching term for the gifting exchange, for the feigning that is being done, for the offering. It's like... Well, not necessarily, you know, if you're going to call it bloat, then there has to be certain things involved with it. But again, I'm not here to argue semantics and, and, and breathe down people's necks about what they call one thing that or the other. But I would approach it in that way when given the chance or opportunity without infringing on somebody's cultic practices. Right. And that's what we're here talking about today. Hearth cult, how people do things um, in their home. Um, the way that I do things, you know, my hearth cult's not going to be the same as yours, and your hearth cult's not going to be the same as the next person. Um, there might be similarities, and there might be things that you become uh, involved with if you if you become friends with people, if you become if you become uh, intertwined in their life. You know, you might be present for some of the things that they do in their hearth, hearth cult, and those things that somebody does may provide you with inspiration to adopt things in your individual practices as well, or maybe to adopt something similar like that in your hearth cult. I think we see this across regions, across cultures, across everything throughout time, you know, a, a inspiration. If you want to call it appropriation, but how somebody or somebody's did something a certain way, at one certain time, other people were exposed to it and said, wow, I like the way that works. I like the way that feels. That would work really well for us over here. You know, so let's let's take this and take that framework, right, and build something of our own with it. You know, again, that's why we have so many, that's why there's nuance to so many things. That's why we have so many things to compare uh, and, and, and find similarities in. Is because at one point in time, it, where it all started, wherever that might have been, you know, uh, came by way of, of other people's influence and other uh, active presence from from other uh, cultures. So, we, you know, it, it goes it goes without saying that, you know, uh, I don't think it's it's doing anything wrong to the tradition itself to find a place for it in your hearth cult. You know, if you um if you were maybe a guest at um somebody's home and they you know they did something specific that you've never seen before and you know you asked about the 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 tradition of what they're doing and they give you some sort of history or background to it then if it if it's something specific and there go the dogs the dogs are going crazy because I've got my father-in-law that comes over and feeds him every day. So when when he comes over, they lose their mind. So if you heard that, that's what that's going on about. So anyway, uh, if, if somebody that you go into their home and, and they say, you know, well, this was done, you know, by my ancestors. And, and this is the reason why it was done. You know, you could ask and say, you know, is this is this something that is specific or closed off? You know, out of respect, you know, is, I, I really like the way this feels. I would like to maybe, you know, use this or adopt adopt this into my 
my hearth cult, my, my individual practices, you know, I think within reason and within respect of somebody else's traditions, and then that's perfectly fine and okay, as long as they're okay with it, as long as it's not like, no, no, you know, first of all, uh, if, if you're in somebody's home and they're sharing that stuff with you, um, that is, that, that, that should be seen as something very, very, uh, sacred. You know, that's, that's my opinion is you wouldn't, you wouldn't walk into somebody's home and take something of theirs in front of their face or, or behind their back even, and then call it your own, you know, um, if it was given to you, if it was, if you were exposed to it in good faith and in trust uh, and entrusted with it, then I guess what you do with it at that point is up to you. And you would just want to be sure to be a, a good caretaker of that and, and um, share it around and, and, and do it, you know, appropriately without tainting um, that gift that was given to you. You know, so again, similarly, if I, you know, if you were to go to somebody's home and they were doing something, a ceremony, a cleansing, a, a prayer or something like that, and it just really spoke to you. Um, it's, it's worth having that conversation, I think, and be like, I would like to adopt this into my practices because it could, it could really help you again in building that, that hearth cult, which I feel again is, is crucial. It's paramount. It's critical to have hearth cult, have your hearth cult. And then next thing you know, what happens is you, you would find something of a, of, of a tradition of yourself that you built around maybe something that someone else did or, or that was inspired by what someone else did and now you have your own tradition you have your own thing you can pass on to your family members or your nearest and dearest right hey this is how i do things and this is how we as a family are going to do things and next thing you know you've established a tradition you have preserved that fire right you have carried those flames as coals and and, and added and breathed new life into these things to be that source of inspiration and to be that thing that enhances your relationship with the divine when that time comes because again these these interactions that we have when we're talking about hearth cult these are all things that while they are spirit while they may be unseen they are near to us they exist in profane space you know and that is that is another part of of heathenry that we 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 see the world as a separation between profane and sacred space. Profane doesn't mean dirty, doesn't mean evil necessarily. There is plenty of good and 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 and, and nefarious things that exist in profane space. Um, but it is just the separation between that and what is in sacred space. When we when we create sacred space, we're going to be talking about this here in just a moment. Um, we are putting something of the profane. We are creating space to reach and, re and, and interact with the divine in that sacred space. And while those things, while we, while everything exists in that sacred space, we are now in the, in the temporarily at least, in the, I say confines, but we are now under sacred time and sacred space. It's kind of why how um, when, when certain people talk about um, partaking in certain rituals um, or doing certain things, they lose track of time, right? What felt like minutes was an eternity or vice versa. What felt like I was gone forever was really just a five minute span of time in profane space, right? That's what we're talking about. When, when those things happen, it, we have transcended and broken those barriers temporarily. And, you know, whether or not you feel those things each and every time you have your moments of dedication or whatever, it, it doesn't mean that you may, you know, you're not going to feel those things every single time. Don't, don't, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want me misconstrued and saying, well, just, just because you defined your sacred space, you, you need to be feeling like you're not a part of this world anymore. That's not, don't expect that. Um, it may happen. You might, you might be really entranced in what you're doing and, and, and have certain things going on that can, uh, provide that experience but just because it doesn't happen and you don't and you don't feel it doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing something wrong um but um so yeah like hearth cult the 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 way that we interact with spirit the way that we interact with the 
spirits that are in our profane space and time that live and interact with us on a day-to-day -day basis, how we interact with them is going to help build uh, uh, our, our worldviews and, and, and establish a, a more holistic approach to how we later on in, in, engage with and deal with the divine or the sacred. So what that can be looking like, what that could potentially appear as needs to start with some things. And so I want to go over, you know, just a few, well, more than a few, but I want to go over some steps, uh, which again are not, this isn't like, when I say blueprint, I'm like, it's a, it's a very loose framework. Okay. So consider this, take what I'm saying into consideration. If it fits great. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't. Um, but one of the first things that you're going to to want to do is is when it comes to hearth cult, right? This is this is we're talking about things within the home, right? Under the confines, under the roof tree, um, under within in within that home, not outside. So you want to locate a space, identify a space within your house, to set up as sacred space. You might call it a shrine, you might call it an altar, you might call it anything, um, and it, it could be. Again, depending on your living arrangements, depending on your um, how much square footage you have, how much you know space you have for you, um, it could be as small or as large as you're capable of of doing so. You know, it could be a, a corner of a room, it could be a mantle, it could be a shelf that you put up, it could be a, a you know a bookshelf or a shelf on a bookshelf. I mean, it could be a little foot stool, it could be a, a small end table. Um, Really, almost anywhere, um, and I've been in some pretty small houses, some some pretty small living spaces that people have, and you know, uh, I've seen really, really nice uh, arrangements of of what you might call an altar or a shrine. So again, whatever you've got going on in your living space, uh, however small or big it might be, um, if you're going to now approach. Hey, realizing, wow, after what he's talking about, I, I, I want to start focusing on my hearth cult. One of the first things you're going to want to do is define a space. Okay. Followed by setting it up. Now, what could that be? A lot of people I know um, in the past have asked me, you know, I want to set up my, my altar. I've never done this before. What do I do? Where do I start? That, again, is going to go more into your hearth cult. There is no one specific thing that one person or multiple people can say that you should have on your altar or your shrine or your, your sacred space, that, that, that area that you have devoted or dedicated as sacred space for your dealings with the divine. Here's the other thing. I say divine, but like the, the spirits and why. Here's the other thing. There are people who I know who have multiple altars, multiple shrines, multiple places that they have in their living space for different things. There might be an ancestral altar, which is dedicated just to their ancestors. I know people who have an altar for their Husfetir, that have an altar for their Kof God. Um, then they have their altar for the gods, and they separate those things for a reason. They don't want to have the space for the ancestors shared with the Kof God or the, or the Husfetir. They want them each to have their own separate living space, their own separate dedicated area. So that way, when you go and you speak to the ancestors, you're not mixing the energy or mixing the thought processes of, of honoring the Husfetir or the gods or any other such thing like that. Your, your, your mind is focused strictly on where you need to focus it on, right? So whatever that is, whether it's, uh, again, um, a little corner, uh, a table, a small bookshelf, a mantle, a shelf um, on top of your television entertainment system. I mean, I've seen all the different kinds of things just anywhere, any, any, any way that it works for you, whatever, however you can make it work. Once you've, once you've identified it, once you've established it as such, um, I've even seen people when it comes to like their Husfetir, uh, they've, they've, put up little cabins or little little village uh, huts or something right and they and they have little figurines and stuff that are the physical representation of the spirits that live in the home or the spirit that lives in the home and so like they will 
again, be able to focus that aspect of their spirituality on this is for the Husvatir. This is their home, this little hut, this little cabin, this little uh, whatever uh, cottage, right? That little figurine that is the physical manifestation of the Kof God, the Husvatir. Um, and, and that is that is how they choose to identify it. Um, but whatever it is, however it is, identify it, locate it, and then start setting it up. How you set it up is going to be entirely up to you, right? A lot, again, the the, the little cabin or little cottage is an idea for your husvatir. You could make a little uh, a little hut or something. You can get, I don't know, like there's ideas that that are around on, on what you want to do. Like, and, it, and it really depends on your approach uh, to your spirituality. You know, do you want to have something very Northern European looking, something Scandinavian looking? Do you want to have something a bit more Southern like in the southern parts of Germany, northern Mediterranean, do you want to have something, you know, that is uh, maybe more indigenous to Native American? Who knows, right? Like, I mean, that's your thing. You're going to develop that and you're going to come up with that your own. And that's what that's the beauty of hearth cult. It is your own. Right. So here that's that, that's an idea. Right. Identify, locate, set it up. Um, next thing you're going to want to do is decide when and how often you're gonna you're gonna engage with uh, with your with your vatir with the with the whites with the the kof god with whatever it is that you're setting your space up for whatever your thing is that you're doing how often are you gonna be doing it is it gonna be daily weekly you know two or three times a week morning evening at night I mean you've got to have something established it can't just be Kind of all willy nilly. Um, again, it goes back to what the importance that heathen replaces on orthopraxis, right? The focus on doing it the right way, and and doing it that way, the the, the repetition of it, and having those habits established, having that that custom, that tradition built, right? So if you locate your your area that you're going to dedicate to your hearth cult practice. Uh, whether it's a prayer to your ancestors or or an offering to your house uh, house god or husvatir, um, once you've located it, once you've set it up, now it's time to decide. I will do this on the same day every week, every day every week, certain days every week, whatever the cadence, whatever the frequency is. That's one of the things that you're going to need to establish, and then continue doing it. Maybe you only start out doing it once a week. You know, maybe you don't want to over promise and under deliver. So you say, well, okay, well, I want to, I don't want to, you know, say I'm going to do it three times a week or every day and then only do it twice. Um, so consider that, right? Consider it being realistic. Maybe you, maybe you start off small and say, all right, I want to do this once a week, you know, every Saturday or every Monday morning or before I go to work, you know, when I end my day on Friday, it's going to be my prayer to my answer, whatever, you know, figure that part out, dedicate a specific time and date or dates um to what you're doing and then see it through the next thing you're going to want to do obviously is choose your offering okay um you want to choose the offerings that you plan to give right so if it's uh again like i mentioned earlier on like maybe it's your breakfast maybe it's your dinner Maybe it's a portion of your meal. Maybe it's something specific that they get every single time that doesn't change, no matter what you're having or what you're doing. Right? Maybe your breakfast one day is you know bacon and eggs, and then the next day it's a you know a burrito, um, or maybe the next day it's not anything. Maybe you skip breakfast. But if your dedicated thing is to gift to the vatir or to do your hearth cult stuff with you know a bowl of soup or a cup of porridge or some oatmeal or cereal or whatever it is, you know, maybe a little scoop of honey on some honeycomb or whatever. I mean, whatever the thing is, figure out what it's going to be and then be consistent with it. Have that consistency. Um, and then, you know, consider the fact too that, you know, again, I'm, 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 I'm going back and forth with this, it has to be the same thing every time versus, well, what does it feel right? Like, what, what do you feel right? Maybe, you know, you ran out of something and you forgot to go to the store. You got to improvise, right? There's going to be times like that, I'm sure. But I think having a good, strong approach to what we're talking about here, having your hearth cult built strong is going to set you up better 
to avoid things like that. You're going to know when things are running low that I need to prepare, right? I need to go and I need to provide, you know, more things. I need to get set up for with with more things that I need to see th see this through. Um, so I think that that is good discipline. I think that that is a good approach to have again for for future encounters that you want to have with the sacred taking things seriously to the point that you're not just you know caught off guard that you're like oh crap i didn't bring my offering to the to the bloat today uh uh what can i scrounge up here as a gift you know if you, you know think about that if, if you were being given something and somebody just like gave it to you out of necessity because they felt like they had to or that they forgot to actually do something meaningful for it you know for you or or to you that uh that 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 gift would not ring so 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 powerful to you you know it wouldn't mean as much to you whereas if they took the time prepared made something whether it was handcrafted or you know they took the time to procure what it is that they needed to do and they did it with 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 heartfelt intentions not only do you want to choose the offerings um that you're going to provide during the ritual you also want to decide where when and how you're going to get rid of those things because um after you perform your your ritual right whatever that hearth cult thing is let's say it's a prayer to your ancestors and let's say the prayer is involving you know berries and and and, and oats um, just again, just using examples, right? Like, let's say that that's the thing that you um, provide for your ancestral hearth cult practice. And now you've got to figure out what am I going to do with this stuff? Well, that's a great question. And, and I've been asked this before, too. You know, what do I do with my offerings after I'm done with them? And it's really very simple. You've got three main ways that you can uh, safely and ethically dispose of your uh offerings you bog it burn it or bury it whatever it is that you're doing whatever the thing is that you're offering if you're going to burn it right you obviously would want to make sure that you can do so in a in a space or in an area that is not going to be harmful you know you don't want to light a fire in the middle of your living room and if you're living in an apartment or out there on a common area a sidewalk where there's you know people um but, you know, maybe there's a spot nearby, a wooded area that you can privately um, leave it to the land. Maybe not even necessarily bury it, right? But you can take those gifts. Let's say they're, you know, biodegradable food bits, you know, things that can then go from the gift that you gave to your house god or your ancestors, whatever. That gift can now be transferred to the land and the land vitir can then receive it you know and so there's this exchange of weird there's this, there's this exchange of the gift um you know that you are are entering into there's this web that you're tying yourself in and around and, and the things that are going on there's an idea right you can leave it out for the land vitir to consume if it's not safe to do that you can bury it again considering the fact of what you're burying what you're putting into the earth is it going to be harmful to the earth is it biodegradable you wouldn't want to put, you know, plastic out there in the ground. That's not biodegradable. That's going to harm the earth. That's going to harm nature. That's going to harm things later on. It's not going to go away. It's going to stay there forever. So you wouldn't want to obviously leave a gift of something that is not natural, you know, like that just kind of goes back to what I, you know, what I was saying is, is put some thought into what you're doing for the gift. Don't just be like, oh, no, I ran out of, you know, ran out of the good oats that I give to my to my husvetir and now all I've got is you know tricks cereal or, or, or something you know what I mean like put some thought behind it put some planning behind it and, and don't give something of, of less than what you would want to be given you know um, I, I remember one time a guy I used to talk to was like uh, I'm, I'm I'm doing a, uh, an offering to Thor you know and I and I he, he, he used Red Bull or he poured out a Red Bull. And I'm like, dude, you can do so much better than that. You know, you can you can do better. You can cook a meal. You can, you know, even if you don't drink alcohol, hell, you can buy a good brew, uh, you know, 
bottle of meat or, or small beer, beer or something, right? Like something of, of more value than a, a Red Bull, <laughs> you know, full of sugar and nasty preservatives and stuff. Right? Put some thought behind it. Put some meaning into what you're doing, right? So, again, whatever. And, and that's, so that's bog, that, or that's berry, that's burn, and bog. Same thing, you know. Um, if you can immolate um, or bury things uh, or incinerate things as, as, as your gift uh, as, as a suitable way of disposal. Um, or again, if it's natural food waste and, and that, that would be natural food waste, you can give to the land and then the land vitir will come and consume it. All right. So that's, that's, that's one thing. The next thing I wanted to talk about was um, purification. Not a lot of people, I think, talk about this aspect of when we uh, have uh, a ritual that we're about to prepare for is purification. How do you de decide um, on, on, on purifying yourself, cleansing yourself, right? You come home after a hard day of work where your work clothes are dirty, you're sweaty, you stink, you know, and then you just go and you pour out a bowl, a bowl of oats in the bowl and you have a fine how do you do to the husvetir, you know? Or do you, again, approach the sacred space that you've defined, that you've identified um, in your house? Have you done this in and in, in are you approaching this in a way that echoes benevolence, right? That you are pious in, in your approach to things. Take some time, cleanse yourself, whether it be a shower. Um, I know... For myself, right, one of the things that I like to do is, is not necessarily like a full sh shower with soap and water, but to go to the river, you know, and to let the waters of the river cleanse me. You know, like that's a space for me that I find to be very healing. I've talked about that before in some of my other content, right? Like the river is my healer. It's like washing things away from me, even though, that, you know, like the water itself may have, you know, critters and, and, and bits and stuff floating around with it. It's still the fact that it's flowing water, it's moving water, and it's and it's in my mind, it's in my heart, it's it's cleansing me away. And other people look at that the same way. If, if they're living near a body of water, they will um, do something similar like that. Or maybe it's, it's, you know, distilled water that you have separate, again, from like your tap. You know, maybe you've boiled it, maybe you've, maybe you've put herbs or, or resin or, or, you know, fine essential oils or something like that in the water to create it as it being something separate from the rest of the water that you drink or bathe in, you know, something of a cleansing nature that you look at and say, when I'm touching this, when I'm encountering this object, I am ritually purifying myself. So that way, when I approach my sacred space, when I do my hearth cult stuff, I am now clean in front of my audience of who I want to be there you know, uh, and be there in front of. So we talked about identifying a space. We talked about setting up your space. How do you want to set your space up? What do you want it to look like? Maybe you already have a space and you haven't really spent much time doing uh, a whole lot of setup on it. You just kind of, when you find things, you put it there. Maybe now it's time to think about it, right? Maybe it's time to define it a bit more. Maybe it's time to cleanse it up a little bit. Maybe there's Things on there that need to be rearranged or moved. Um, maybe there are things that need to be removed. You know, things to be replaced. Who knows? I've my my altar has has changed its look over the years many times. You know, and 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 still will change its look many more times. I'm sure. You know, maybe not every week or every year, but there are going to be times where I'm going to look at this. And I'm going to say, yeah, there's there's things that I need to move. There's things I need to remove, relocate, right? Why is it all so important? Again, I want to reiterate. It is important because heathenry is an orthopraxic religion. It, it is more important for a lot of us um, to get the correct performance of right actions, um, you know, and that, and that that is more important than the correct belief. Some other things to consider is, is this note right here that I'm putting on screen is that by performing the ritual actions repetitively and with frequency, we can we can deepen our relationships 
with our ancestors and household gods, right? The Husvatir, the Kof God, and receive the benefits from these relationships. It goes back to what I was talking about with, or what we hear, not what I was talking about today, but like what we hear so often is, is, you know, it's better to give little than to overgive. And the, 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 the road between friends, uh, the, the, if you walk the road between friends, even though the distance may be long, the, 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 it, it, it's actually a short road because there is more time being spent between the two. The, the focus on these things, you know, the focus on um, meaningful, repetitive action, approaching things with benevolence, piety, this creates in us a sense of sacredness, you know, that, that, that we are bonding with what is unseen and those who are unseen. We are bonding with them in ways that we normally couldn't or wouldn't. If we're all just careless about it, if we're all willy-nilly about it, that's not going to set in us the, the, the worldviews, the, 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 the concepts, the idea of being able to really and truly interact with the divine. And again, there are there we, we see this across many cultures. The Germanic people should be no less, you know, or, or any different when it comes to this stuff, just because it's not necessarily documented or written down very specifically that, hey, you know, the the, the Olofsons did it a certain way, and then you know the you know the the Alfredsons did it another way, and this is how they did it, and, and then we have it all written down exactly. Just because we don't necessarily have that doesn't mean that it wasn't done. It was done. We, we, we know from some of the examples that I mentioned earlier, again, if you go in the description and show notes of the episode, when you go in there and you um, find the, the information in, in some of those source materials, you'll see that it was very specifically, it was orthopraxy. You know, they didn't deviate. They didn't get out of the, 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 the structure of what it was because they had this sense of if I don't, there's consequence. If I if I break this pattern, if I if I don't adhere to this strictly, um, then I'm going to miss out. I'm going to incur the wrath of of gods, or or I'm going to you know there's going to be consequences. And <clears throat> that is one of the the things that I think in modern times we have lost as heathens. You know, there's this there's this overarching thought of oh, just do whatever you feel like. Everything that you do, anything that you do, it's fine. It's okay. It's, you know, your intentions are with the best of intentions. It's, it's going to be okay. I mean, yeah, like with, yeah, if your intentions are right, but guess what? Like people, uh, <laughs> there, there's plenty of people that have the best intentions in mind when they're, when they're doing really shitty things. Like, let's be honest. Um, so intention Pure, honest intentions, yes. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not trying to take away from that. And 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 anybody that knows me, real and in person, knows that I I, I think that that is important. Um, but I also think there needs to be structure, and there needs to be a, there needs to be that praxis. You know what I mean? Like there needs to be that we do it this way, this specific time. Because again, it, the reason why why that is so important is because it it it, it strengthens our relationships with our ancestors with the local spirits that live with us in our homes. I mean, we, we share space with them. This isn't just our home. It's their home too, you know? And if the house is dirty, if it's unkept, if it's a mess, if it's a disaster, if there's always fighting, if it's arguing, if it's that, right? That is not a conducive place to have, you know, why would you want to live in a place like that? If, you know, the Kofgad, the, the, the house whites, the Husvatir are not going to be happy. There's always going to be that, you know, state of, of turmoil, that, that disarray, that, that unkempt, just unpleasant vibe to the area, you know. Um, and I'm talking again about some very specific things when it comes to like how you approach or create sacred space in your home and, and maybe setting up an altar. Like this can be stuff that you can, I guess, you know, again, framework that you can build around any sort of thing. Maybe you're uh, a Celtic pagan listening to this and all this is resonating and ringing very true. Um, again, framework, right? The purpose behind it, the reason behind it is to put you in that state of mind of when I come to this part of the, the room, this part of the room is for those specific things. For me to talk to this specific person or persons 
or to interact with this specific uh, spirit or entity, right? And that's it. When I create this sacred space, whether it be through fire or through incense or through sprinkling water or through smudging or whatever your, again, your hearth cult practice would be, because again, everybody's going to be like, well, how do I create sacred space? What's your hearth cult on it? You know, is it through fire? Is it through smoke? Is it through water? Is it through salt? Is it through crystals? I mean, is whatever. That's your hearth cult. That is what you do. That is your hearth cult. That is your individual cultic practice, how you create sacred space. Um, and, and that's what's important. Because, again, when you, when you get into the bigger dealings of, of, with the divine, with the gods, when you talk about actual bloat ceremonies with, with more people and everything, that has to be established first before you can really and truly be ready to enter into that frame of mind to, to, to deal with uh, what, what's about to happen and to engage with what's about to happen. So um, I think that pretty well covered everything that I was, you know, wanting to say. Um, and I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope that you did and find this to be useful. I hope that you found it to be enlightening maybe something that you're gonna take and and consider employing in your spiritual practices your individual cultic practices your hearth cult if you don't have it you maybe should right maybe this is a time to wake up and consider the fact that wow i've been so worried about the gods you know the divine what is outside of profane space that i haven't taken the time to consider what's going on in in and around me and maybe ignoring those things have been one of the reasons why uh again i don't know everybody's situation so don't you know don't sit over you know me over here saying well jesse's judging on his podcast no i'm just saying that well maybe because you've been neglectful because there has been a disconnect with you know interacting with what's going on in profane space maybe that's the reason why things aren't feeling so connected with you on a grander scale. Maybe you, again, put that cart ahead of the horse. Maybe you need to hitch that wagon. Maybe you need to fix the wheels of the wagon before you hitch it up and start riding it. So there's my ramblings for this week on Hearth Cult and why it's so important. I, if, if you guys you know, wouldn't care, uh, check down in the, or put down in the comments what you thought of this episode. If you have a Hearth Cult, practice that you would be willing to share again no pressure this is the type of topic where i would not divulge my own hearth cult practices um at least not on this platform um i've shared some things that i've heard of but that's 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 not naming anybody specifically that's that's things i've just either encountered or have had told to me in in full anonymity um is is, is respected you know so ideas thoughts um, your ideas and thoughts are welcome if you want to share them down in the comments. Or if you want to, again, call in. Maybe you're not watching this during the live premiere. Maybe you want to think about this a bit and either write or call in. That number is 615-671-9832. It's open 24-7. Just call and leave a voicemail. I'll listen to it, and I'll put you on the air if you want. I'll put you here on the podcast on the next episode. It'd be great to hear what people's voices are. Um, but if you don't want to do that and you want to write in instead, you can do that at MidgardMusingsTN at gmail.com. Um, and aside from that, you can follow me on all my socials and DM me anywhere. Uh, Facebook is the best one. Uh, Twitter, I will get those as well. Or what is now, what is it now, X? Yeah, message me on X. It's weird. Um, Instagram, I really don't, I, I, I check it a few times a week. I don't get the messages very often. So if you're going to message me on, on the gram, uh, just know that I won't see them right away. Um, the best way to message me in real time is on Facebook. Um, but also check out Patreon if you want to become a patron on Patreon. I'm, I'm kicking the, the perks back up so you you know, get the, the monthly rune draws. Um, if you're a chieftain tier or above, if you're a scald tier or above, you get a once a month monthly uh, uh, like a virtual session with me, a one-on-one -on -one session, third Thursday of every month. Again, all that stuff's going to be linked in the uh, link tree link that's annotated in the 
uh, description and show notes of this podcast. So like always, check it all out. See what fits you. At the very least, please give this podcast an upvote, like it, share it, you know, um, interact in that sort of way. Follow me on all the socials. Those are all free ways that you can really help support what I do here. And, and, uh, and all the other ways are just our monetary. And if you're, you know, willing and wanting to, to help a guy out um, monetarily, um, there's multiple ways that you can do it. Also, again, as I mentioned early on in the podcast, stick around uh, soon for updates on some birch rune sets that I'm going to be making. Uh, for sale, all of the sales of which proceeds, aside from shipping, um, but all the proceeds of which are going directly to fund this upcoming pilgrimage that myself and my tribe are going on. Um, so it would be great if you want to help us out. You get an awesome rune set that I made, and then you're helping fund the trip. All right. So that is all that I've got for you this week. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a thumbs up, share it around, do all those things. Like I said, thank you all so much for watching and listening to today's episode. And until we hear from each other again. May the gods continue to notice you and may your ancestors smile upon you.